many years ago, God revealed that there was a need for capacity building in his house. There was a need for training, there was a need to provide support services to the activities of the body of Christ in order to build capacity. We are in the service of capacity building. It's a great joy for this day to have come. Let us pray together. Lord, we thank you for what you are doing. And we believe that the time will come where people from all nations will come to this land to find the original apostolic template of ministry and life. So we ask, Lord, that you bless this meeting and bless your people. In Jesus' name, amen. You may be seated. God bless you. Now, where is my friend, uh, Pastor Joe Great? Okay, I've been troubled. But I saw you escaped. Amen. That's my friend. He's, he's a dynamite. Hallelujah. Now, I want us to look at two scriptures because we need to release some impartation on our Bible school graduates. And so we'll look at a few scriptures. But before we do that, we want to acknowledge the presence of the relatives of the people that are either being ordained today or relatives of the graduates of the Bible school. Hallelujah. Okay, we'll do that during the ordination half time. Something happened in the book of Acts chapter 2. I don't want to trouble you with so much reading. So let's do Acts chapter 19, verse 9. I tell a short story, and I'll be out of your way. In Acts chapter 19, we do from verse 8. And he went into the synagogue and spoke boldly for the space of three months, disputing and persuading the things concerning the kingdom of God. But when divers were hardened and believed not, he spake, but spake evil of that way before the multitude. He departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one Tyrannus. Disputing daily in the school of one what? Tyrannus. The event that took place on the day of Pentecost began from heaven. It was not facilitated by it. It was not supported by it. It was an act of God's sovereignty. And that act of God's sovereignty was as a result of the fact that an immortal was ascending the office of the Christos. The office of the Christ. One that has satisfied the claims of divine justice. One that has paid the price to bring the throne of God that was domiciled in heaven and to make it functional upon the face of the earth. One that has actualized the hope of heaven upon his return to heaven. Something critical happened. He was ushered into an office that was vacant from all eternity. Hallelujah. I say hallelujah. Amen. You know, when Peter gave the great confession, the great confession was a revelation of Jesus' ministry and Jesus' person. 
thou art the Christ. Thou art the son of the living God. As the Christ, it was his ministry that he referenced. As the son of the living God, it was his person that he referenced. Even though it was prophetic that Jesus was the one that was ordained to be the Christ, he actually entered into the office of the Christ on the day of Pentecost. And I need to let us understand that it was that office that Lucifer coveted in the book of Isaiah chapter 14 verse 12 to 14. He coveted that office. The office existed in the eternities of God without an occupant. Hallelujah. Are you with me? Now so Lucifer desired it and went for it and lost his own status in that kingdom. Meanwhile, Jesus did not count it anything to be in the Godhead and to be at equality with the Father. He didn't count it something to cling on to. And he was willing to let his status go in order for him to become an administrator that will bring to pass that which is the desire that was captured within the community of the Godhead. He relinquished the compliments that were attached to his status. And he got an office. Are you with me? Lucifer was gone in for an office. And he lost his own status. In the kingdom of God. It was a high service in heaven. A spiritual ceremony. As his majesty was offered into the office of the Christ. The implication of that is that he became the administrator of all of the purposes of God. It means that the father can do nothing outside of that office. And you, you cannot, you cannot access the father outside of that office. If you pray, you pray through by his name. Hallelujah. If you pray, it is office that gives you the capacity for your prayers to be potent enough to ascend into the spirit. He becomes the great divide between all that is alive and all that is dead. And by that office shall the government of God advance and take root in the nations of the world. Hallelujah. It was a high office in glory. In fact, the day you gave your life to Christ, the Holy Spirit in your heart is actually operating that office right there. Because the throne that he paid the price to bring here is now domiciled in your heart. And it is this Holy Spirit that operates the office of the Christ in your heart. Just like we have a governor. He's the representative of the president in this particular region. Do you understand what I'm talking about? So without the work of Jesus, the Holy Spirit will have no legal pedestal to carry out his ministry. So he's not there as the Holy Ghost. He's there as a representative of Jesus. And that's why he doesn't have an agenda. It's that which Jesus wants that he implements in your heart. Do you understand what, what, what I'm talking about? So a very holy thing happened in heaven. And on the strength of that holy thing that happened in the upper room, some men on earth were desiring the promise that Jesus gave them. And historical perspective captures that they fasted and prayed for 10 days. And when the 10th day was accomplished, they were synchronized, they were in full alignment with heaven. And it happened to be that that 10th day was the day of coronation in heaven. So they were in line with that which was finding expression in the heavenlies. If you are still with me, say amen. amen. They were in line. And because they were in line, a telex message had to be sent to the earth that the great monarch of Zion has been installed. Because in the book of Acts of the Apostles chapter 2 when an explanation, when perspective was given to that which was happening in the upper room, Peter said that Jesus that you crucified the one that you killed the one that you thought you cut off right now in heaven God has, has exalted him and made him both Lord and 
Christ. I, I want us to capture that in the scripture. I think that is in the book of Acts chapter 2 verse 36. Now those two things mentioned are offices. She doubles as the Christos and he doubles as the Lord. It's in the book of Philippians chapter 2 that we see the capacity of his office as Lord. It was an event that took place in the heavens of which even demons are aware. And the earth was also sent a message on the strength of the event that was consummated in heaven. He said, therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God had made that same, somebody say, that same, same Jesus. Jesus. Now, not another Jesus, the same one whom he crucified. What has God made him? Both Lord and Christ. Now, on the strength of the fact that he was conferred with the honors of lordship of the entire universe of God. You see, in, in, in kingdom understanding, name is not an, a name is not an object of taxonomy. It's not a basis by which somebody is identified. It's not, the purpose, it's not for the purpose of classification. A name in kingdom context is a, is a reflection and expression of authority. Are you with me? Alright, so in the book of Philippians chapter 2, we see Jesus the Lord. And in Jesus the Lord, there, there were actually seven layers of authority that he received on the strength of his judicial work. It's, uh, those seven layers of authority are the things that translate to the seven horns that are seen in the book of Revelation chapter 5. There were seven deaths he died. And then there were seven layers of authority attributed to the death that he died that is visible in the book of Revelation. His immortal form was revealed in the book of Revelation. And he was seen to be a personality that has seven horns and seven eyes. Now that's his immortal description. Are you with me? And so all his powers, all of his authority was captured in a metaphoric rendering. Hallelujah. And that rendering was at par with the deaths he died in the book of Philippians chapter 2 in order for him to have all authority. And that authority that he has is captured within his name. Are you with me? So that at the mention of the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow. And then the scope of the authority was also captured. Of things where? In heaven. Of things where? And of things where? Now, my emphasis this morning is not Jesus the Lord. It's Jesus the Christ. And when that throne was occupied and he sat in that throne, I need to give you a prophetic hindsight scripture that will give us perspective to the event that took place in heaven. Hallelujah. You see, one of the reasons why the books of the prophets exist is to give us perspective. Alright, let's go to the book of Psalms 110. Now, I don't intend to read so many scriptures. But in order to bring you into the understanding of what we want to do this morning, um, I am under pressure to read more than one scripture. So please pardon me. Hallelujah. Ah, the hallelujah is, is weak. Lord have mercy. You are not aware we, we celebrate his lordship. That's why we're here. The reason why we have access to grace is because he is domiciled on that throne. Because the Bible reveals that the source of grace is a throne of which we are, adjoined, we are, we are, we are employed to come boldly unto. Unto what? The very source of grace is administered by a throne. The throne of the Christus. 
he's the administrator of all of god's divine purposes it's in him that god's intentions find legality and possibility in my own opinion and that's my opinion he's the most influential personality of the godhead it's an opinion it's not the bible it's what opinion all right now that's why Peter said, if it is true that you have tasted that the Lord is what? Is precious. It is something that you come into experientially. You don't learn that in Bible school. You taste and you realize that what? The Lord, He is precious. In my own opinion, He's the most important provides infrastructure for the will of the Godhead to find expression and for the good pleasure of God to be realized. Now he has a throne and that throne is not time-based, it's eternal, it's an eternal throne. All right, Because of high, how highly exalted that throne is, is set. Because according to the scriptures, that throne is set in the very heights of the heavens. And the reason why it was deliberately set there is so that the Christos, are you with me? Oh, because you are not here, I will reduce the revelation. Now, amen. If you were following, would have doubled, would have doubled into, into some matters. Hallelujah. The reason why the devil cannot win at the end of the day, is because where the devil's throne is now, is not so exalted. Now, the extent to which you can feel is a function of how exalted your throne is. According to the book of Ephesians, the Bible says he, he, his, his throne is what? Is high in the heavens. Why? Because God wants him to feel all things. Now, so the devil's throne is not that exalted. He cannot feel all things. They can't feel out. It, by positioning, the devil is disadvantaged. Satan is it. It's only people that don't know where his throne is that think he's so powerful. Satan can say, I will kill you by nine o'clock and make it happen. Why? It is not given unto him. His throne has a deficient position in the spirit. And we are here. To make it evident that the devil, the devil is not in control. Hmm, yes. I know they do witchcraft in your village. Somebody, they will use witchcraft. Somebody will suspend. No problem. It will come to pass. It, they, after they finish all the incantations, the thing won't work. Because his throne is, is positionally deficient. So it shall come to pass. In the fullness of times and that everything will reflect Christ in the days to come. Everything. Because his domicile where? High in the heavens. He will feel everything and he will reflect everything. He wants to feel our government so that our government will reflect him. He wants to feel our economy. He wants to become the philosophy behind our economy. Such that our economy will reflect him. When you come and you see the structure of our economy, we notice that this, this kind of trend is a reflection of a throne. He wants to feel everything. And it's our calling to enthrone him so that he can feel everything. Now, in the book of Psalms 110, verse... Are you with me? 110. Please turn your Bible. I want you to get the spiritual aspect before we talk about the graphic, physical aspect. In Psalms 110, from verse 1, the Bible says, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thy enemies dying first two. Now what is happening here is a discussion among the members of the Godhead. Hallelujah. 
Now this was the coronation ceremony that took place in the heavens. Are you still with me? Now the people outside, can you can you see the scriptures on the? Is it visible? All right. The people in the other um, overflow, can you hear my voice? If you can hear, say Amen. Okay, okay, they are there. All right. Now this is. In this scripture, David is operating in the office of a prophet. David happened to be a disciple of, of Samuel. So Samuel taught him prophetic and priestly things. And that's why David did some things that some other kings did that, <laughs> that dethroned them. He did the same things. He dabbled into priestly business, but he was accurate. And those kings tried the things that he tried and they lost their kingdom. It is because he was discipled. Samuel discipled him in the things of priesthood and the things of the prophetic. Now, in, in Psalms 110, this is one of the few scriptures in, in, in which David was functioning fully in the capacity of a prophet. And he was unveiling something that was the subject of the vision that he had had in the spirit where he saw the father speaking to the son and what was the statement he said sit down at my right hand that was the office the throne when jesus finished his work his judicial work and he ascended into the heavens he was received by the father that was where the coronation service began and the end of that service he gained a throne at the right hand of god now see right hand in kingdom context doesn't mean this side <laughs> in kingdom context right hand doesn't mean right hand means someone that can rule in your absence right hand means the highest honor in the kingdom of God in Nigeria the highest honor is GCFR grand commander of the federal republic now, so Jesus was given the highest honor that exists in the kingdom of God, such that he had a right to, in fact, in fact, in fact, the father had committed government to him. That's what it means to occupy the, the seat of the right hand. And so when he came back, the father said, you, you sit down and do administrative work. Your efforts has created illegal platform of advantage for our agenda. You don't need to walk again. Sit down. And I will take the responsibility to make all your enemies your footstool. That was a promise that the father made to the son. These are, uh, these are issues that took place where? I, I just see following. Uh, it's a story I'm trying to tell. Mm. So we are still in the heavenlies trying to consider what happened. You say, all right, you sit here. I have, uh, you have created the legal basis for me to accomplish the agenda. Now, the next verse now reveals how God intends to fulfill the promise he has made to Jesus. Are you with me? Next verse. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. In keeping with the promise that the father made to the son. The Lord, the father. He will send the rod of his strength out of Zion with a mandate. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. The rod of his strength is the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit left Zion the moment Jesus occupied that throne. And he came down here with a mandate. Rule. See, see rulership on earth was not possible because Jesus had paid, paid the price to make the throne of God that is in heaven to make it functional on earth. Now, if you are a carnal man, when you see Jesus on the cross, you will call it crucifixion. But unknown to you, you will not realize that so many people were crucified before Jesus. And so many people were crucified after. Even Spartacus too was crucified. <laughs> Uh, 
Hallelujah. Now, so what made Jesus' crucifixion significant? I believe Jesus was the only one that was crucified and the reason for his being crucified was was written on the cross. And it was written in three languages. It was written in, in Hebrew. It was written in Latin and in Greek. That is to say, if you were literate in the then world, you would have been able to read the reason why Jesus was crucified. Behold, what? The king of the Jews. He, he was crucified. He was paying a price to bring a kingdom here. The king. That price he paid was to make the throne of God that was functional in heaven to become functional here on earth. So the Holy Spirit can receive the charge now. Roll down in the midst of your enemies. That's the mandate he came with to the end. Are you with me? Now, so now we have finished that aspect. I'm concerned about. So, I, I, so can we conclude now that the Pentecost Day service, the service began where first in heaven. So it started in the throne room. Then he condescended into the upper room. So let's see what happened in the upper room. Have you gotten what happened in the throne room? The Christus was coronated. And in keeping with the promise of the Father, the rod of God's strength had to leave Zion to come upon the face of the earth with a mandate. What? Ruled out. And this was the same scripture that Peter quoted on the day of Pentecost. This scripture. It was after I quoted this scripture that he said, Let all the house of Israel know assuredly that the same Jesus whom you crucified, God has made him both Lord and under Christ. So that's throne room business. Now let's go to the upper room. Because revival first begins from the throne room. Then he now comes to the upper room. Then he now moves into the classroom. So, just calm down. They are, it, revival is executed in rooms. Mm. The first one is throne room. <laughs> then what? Upper room. Now, so let's go to the upper room. Then we'll now go to classroom. We lose our, all our revivals in the classroom. It doesn't pass through classroom. So there's no capacity building. So what began in the throne room that came into where? The upper room never gets where? To the classroom. And after the classroom, it now goes from room to room. Can we go over it again? From the throne room to the upper room, then to the classroom, before it now goes to room to room. And that's the story of revival. Alright. What happened in the upper room? Because the guys that were in the upper room did not know what happened overhead. They were just praying and fasting. So the way it happens in the immortal side is different from the way it happens in the mortal side. But it's the same thing. No? And then in the upper room, they were praying. They were waiting for God. They were crying out to God that Jesus, you gave us a promise. And you said we should wait in Jerusalem. We should tarry here in this location. Not Judea, not Samaria, but where? Jerusalem is the place to tarry because there is a promise that you have granted us. Hallelujah. Now I need to say something quickly because it was in the book of Luke that Jesus said, Tarry ye in Jerusalem until you are endued. Oh my God, you are not here. Until what? Where is the power going to come from? On high. Now, the Greek word that is translated endued is the word in Greek called enduo. 
tarry ye in Jerusalem until you become endowed with power. Now, hallelujah. Uh, you see, that word endure actually refers to someone that, you know, Ogbe, Ogbe stand up. Someone that is as slender as, as Ogbe now. I was like that before. Well, I'm no longer a good example for this particular matter. You may see that. Like... In the Greek culture, are you with me? The Greek culture, there's so much, so much romantic undertones in the Greek culture. And a man can do anything to get a woman in the Greek culture. So, some women don't like men that are slim. So, there's a spiritual thing that is normally done. Eh? When they do the thing, they put it, there's something like a ball, and they add it. It's spiritual. Add a thread to it. Then, the herbalist or anything they call it will roll that ball and hit your chest. Boom! When it hits your chest, boom, you will now. And do you will now have a broad chest? So it's when that chest comes out, you go and propose that time. <laughs> Knowing fully well that the damn said doesn't like he only she only likes people that are endo. So Jesus said, Tarry, tarry in Jerusalem, <coughs> remain in that location. Something is coming from on high. And when that thing comes upon you, what will happen? Now, you could see Peter that denied Jesus three times on the day of Pentecost. After endure, he stood and his message converted 3,000 people. He said, the way I'm seeing you, you don't have the stature to survive this job. You need to what? Endure. Now, so, let us see the details in the environment of endure. Can we look at that? I don't want to read on that scripture, but because you know Acts 2. When the rod of the strength of God left heaven and invaded it, it came in form of a sound. In fact, in the Greek, that, that thing is an alarm signal. A strange alarm signal that was audible to spiritual people. And that alarm signal was accompanied by a wind. It was the wind that the Kana people heard. And all of the whole wind was going into one building. That was a sight. A hurricane, a tsunami was hitting a city. And it entered one building. That was enough attraction for the entire people. It was the Holy Spirit that was making an appearance on earth. He was coming with a mandate. What? A mandate to, to rule. So he did not come like a gentle, like a dove. He came like what? A wing. That's why revivals are like wings. Because it's an execution of a mandate of dominion, a mandate of rulership. Now, a lot of people say we like church to be pious. Let church be sanctimonious and sacramental. You don't understand the mandate by which the Holy Ghost came to the earth. He did not come here to. He came to what? To who? Came with force. He came with a mandate of rulership and that was how he invaded the room the entire room was was switched on and as spiritual activities began to happen a, a multicum of activities a multicum of activities and somehow their eyes were open they saw cloven tongues as of fire and suddenly their utterance changed all these things were happening. It was a mighty wind propelling the entire action. 
at that point their operations had transcended the human mind because when the guys in town came to analyze what was happening they said this must be why if you don't understand what is happening you will misjudge it just like we went for a meeting in one village and they say we, we are blood drinkers oh that we drink blood now what are we saying like this if it's not in invocation we were not the first person that received that kind of misjudgment even on the day of pentecost when the invasion took place they say it was it was wine that was at work. but the bible says they were filled with the holy spirit and most importantly they were endured when peter stood to speak jesus jesus he, he drew from the heritage he drew from current politics he drew from scriptures and it happens to be that there were people from every part of the world even from africa africa was represented and some of the tongues and interpretation of tongues that went out that day people from libya were able to understand them because they spoke in their native tongue it was a wonder that had taken place upon the face of the earth and the language that god confused on the tower of babel god had restored it and the reason for which he restored it is so that we can preach the gospel in every tribe the gospel can run You know, there was a meeting that was held and a white man began to speak in tongues and what he was speaking was clear Igede, Igede. A white man began to speak in Igede language. So the people that were Igede did not need a translation because they were hearing their language. The Igede people were convinced that this is the work of God. Because among the people were some of the people that served the man. The man couldn't speak Igede. And then he now mounted the pulpit. And he began to speak in tongues. It was Igede language. It was. A wonder had taken place. Because men were in duo. And just in case you are here, you bought Toyota Matrix vehicle last week. you are a member of the house of rep state state assembly member what you are you are on earth but what those men became they became by something that came from heaven whereas demons can intimidate you with your title demons can invade your house and you not even have healthy legs to prepare the throttle of the metrics because you don't what you have and what you have gathered what you have amassed they have no authority in the realm of the spirit but these guys have been endured by something that came from where from on high that was where the book of acts of the apostles were was written because the apostles after they were endured they acted it was an action thing. Action. Action. And that's why Jesus said, these signs will follow them that believe. Just in case you don't see signs. Just in case there was, there's no action. Let me stop there. What, your guess is as good as mine. <laughs> because the mandate is what? Rule thou. The next verse in Psalms 110 now reveals to us that the Holy Spirit even though he came with a mandate to rule cannot rule by himself he must rule in partnership with men and with women and that's why the next verse in verse 3 of Psalms 110 it reads thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power 
there will be alignment on earth people will be willing to associate with the mandate for which the holy ghost has come that's our duty now let, let's try to give perspective to this scripture quickly he said that people shall be willing in the day of thy power that is he was actually referring to in the day that the holy spirit is available the proof of his presence will be in in a willingness he will seize people's will he will break their will and he will make them to be aligned with him he will conquer men and the only reason for which this man will live is to partner with him to fulfill the mandate i know you built a house in a place and the moment you try to pray in the house you began to receive attacks from roundabout just remember that you are to partner with the holy spirit to fulfill a mandate of of government that mandate will produce casualties there are some witches that will insist that they must strike because we were here before you came now you want to displace us and they don't take those things lightly but in the process of the clash some will give up their lives because it's a rulership mandate some become victims of the power that surges uh, and it's nobody's fault you know there are, there are casualties in every battle it's nobody no there's nobody, nobody's fault. we don't go out to fight all right we just follow the mandate there are other ways to relate to the mandate we can come and say ah we surrender, we surrender. and even if you don't surrender step aside let's continue our journey it will be well with you. But when you now say, hey, these people are causing problems. You want to, ah, die people. That's when you will know that we have been endured. So even though it's a message of peace, we preach. In order for peace to be established sometimes, uh, there's chastisement. Because the Bible says, the chastisement that brought us peace there's some people are chastised so that peace can come because the mandate of governance that is released are you still with me it's a mandate because as we go back after this conference you are going back with that mandate to your locality what's the mandate rule down in the midst because the father had promised the son and you are one of the foot soldiers that will synchronize with the holy spirit to perform that promise Ruda. Ruda. in the office one day one of our general managers who i came in for, for an operational meeting fasting as i was praying and fasting praying i was praying in the meeting then my eyes now open. And I saw the general manager. And he knew that I, I've seen him. He had weapons. You know those days that our people used to fight? War. He was, his regalia in the spirit was like a warrior. Huh? You wear this garment to come to the office. It's only you that thinks that office is natural. People drink alligator water to come there. People drink all kinds of things. But the mandate is what? Ooh. it's not very friendly it's a dominating kind of mandate we were not the ones that initiated it it came from where from, from on high the only thing that happened to us is that when it came we were in duo mm. we had to take that man's case up in prayer it was on the seventh day of the prayer that I saw a wind come out of heaven, a wild wind. And as the wind was, was twisting round, he picked that man and threw him off his seat. The next day I went to the office and my colleagues visited me and I prophesied. I said, It shall come to pass that this man you see today. You will see him no more because 
in the in the mandate of rulership he became a very interesting subject he became an interesting subject that we had to work on to ensure that the mandate prospers we have come to this platform to rule that's the mandate do you know it took seven days for the man to be uprooted from that city? Seven days. Just seven. And some of the colleagues that visited me that I prophesied to were Muslims. And in seven days time it came to pass. It was so strong that the imam of our office gave me a lift. <laughs> because he doesn't want to know, want his members to know that he consulted me. So he, he gave me, he said, I'll drop you at home today. I said, oh, well, that's wonderful. <laughs> and while we're going, he said, I heard you prophesy and it comes to pass. I said, well, that's God's power. That uh, as you go back, ask God about me. <laughs> Rule down. I wasn't really interested in his prayer point. But when I knelt down to pray that evening, my eyes opened. And I beheld a fair lady. I was the daughter of a politician. That they wanted to take as a second wife. And the Lord said that when he marries that woman, his family will be destroyed. Because he wants to do that to get some political advantage in his state. So that eventually he can, he can take advantage of it. So I went to him and I said, I saw a fair woman. That you want to marry. She's the daughter of a politician. And your intention of marrying her is so that you can become politically relevant to your state and have some advantages. But he said, that will be the end of your family. The man shouted. He, he drew me to a corner and said, here, yeah, I've gone far with this thing. <laughs> how will we, how will we do it now? I should go back to that, to the prayer and see if... Some people that can be hostile to Christianity on, 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 on the streets, they know where they go. <laughs> Friends, the mandate is ruled out in the midst. Ruled out in the midst. Who told you that? Okay. Those days on, on campus, we had hostile VCs who say, okay, what we'll do now is we'll ask God to give him enough problems so that he'll be distracted. So he, the problem that he can't handle will start factions, fights, and he will fight for five years. After five years, he'll just discover his tenor has finished. People set him up. Because the mandate is what? Now, so from the upper room, he passed to the classroom, which is where I asked us to meet. And that's why we have a classroom, the school of tyrannos. In Acts chapter 19 verse 9. Let's have that on the screen. That's where I'm going. Because you need to be trained. Many of you have been Christians for many years. You don't know the Holy Spirit. You don't know God. Because you have never been to the classroom. And one of the most unfortunate things is when someone is so proud that he cannot learn. You live a life that is defective. A life that, that is, is diminished. A life that is not altogether what God intended. Because you cannot harness the privileges that you have available to you in Christ Jesus. But when the, when the divers were hardened and believed not, but spake evil of the way before the multitude, he departed from them and separated the disciples, disputing daily in the school of one tyrant. So from the upper room, from the throne room to the upper room, it came into the classroom. Now, they wanted to understand the ways of God. So they were disputing. When they bring a scripture, one will bring another scripture. Okay, if this is what this scripture means, what about this scripture? They were disputing. It was, it was a very interactive kind of class. Until everyone was adequately instructed in the things that pertain to God, they could represent it. They understand policy statements from heaven they understand the present revelation position of the spirit they were equipped to do that kind of business hallelujah now that's the idea 
of the school of tyrants it's after the classroom that the move moves from room to room you see the apostles had a strategy the strategy because of the way their society was hallelujah because of the way their society was they had a strategy now those days in israel those days in jerusalem those days houses were clustered all right one house by another one one house on top of one one house beside one one house behind one so they were clustered like that so the strategy that they adopted in infiltrating the entire territory was house churches and you see in order to establish house churches it's not it's not the work of theologians as it were but people that knew the ways of god are you with me people that have the character and the power of god at work in their lives because it's the houses are so close if you quarrel with your wife they your neighbor will know you don't believe a neighbor will know so they were under pressure to live right they were under pressure to maintain the supernatural edge with which they evangelized there was nothing any government to, could do to stop their movement because it was the strategy of house churches you cannot regulate every house and from there they infiltrated the ranks of men until it came to pass that even caesar did not have as much authority as the church had when he kills one they are not in force upon another when he slays one two people become prophets when he takes one prophet out ten other prophets are ordained he saw that it was the hand of an immortal that was at work because a spirit is involved the more they put pressure on the church the more agree who told you boko haram will win boko haram began on earth it's human beings that gather with the devil to plan god started where in heaven who told you that something that you orchestrate on earth can nullify that which began from heaven meanwhile we are not speaking when it is not empty talk i've been in Kano. yes during the riot you come for bibles and i was a preacher in Kano. you come for bible study two of your members are dead and you have to explain from the scriptures something cogent to make every other person continue we were there one day we had to open the scriptures where jesus said if if you don't have a sword sell your garment and buy one oh you have not been there okay let me stop let me stop ah, yeah, 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 yeah. No, no leave that leave that it's not part of it. you cannot destroy that which began from where from heaven you planned on it to destroy something that began from heaven you are trying to kick against the barbed wire that's what jesus told paul he said why it is hard to kick against the pricks hard to fight the barbed wire because anything you do you are the one that will be hurt it's hard please help me tell your neighbor satan is not in control no you didn't even believe it you didn't believe it. turn to your neighbor preach for me satan is not in control It's hard to kick against the barbed This was the inspiration that led us to set up the Adulam Bible College. It happens to be that the word Adulam is from the Bible. When some people saw it, they thought it was an Islamic word. They saw it on our website. They say our website has been hacked. Muslims have hacked the website. It wasn't hard. There was a place where David's destiny was incubated. That was where he trained the military of Israel for the next generation. The cave Abdullah. It was in that cave he, he, he was in an hold. Where he looked, overlooked the well of Bethlehem. That was under philistine rule and he desired saying that i may drink of the wells of bethlehem and one of three of the mighty men rose up those were people that came to him in debt they came because they were tired of life they came because they were troubled 
they resorted to him when they heard he was in Abdullah. It was out of charlatans that he raised champions. The Davidic spirit knows how to shape men. Out of those discontented, disgruntled people, there were three mighty men. And when David expressed his expectation, the mighty men arose. In fact, they gave, the scriptures gave us their credentials. What's the first one? Is this Shammah, the son of Agi? If you are going to choose a weapon for, of war, you will not choose a spear because the affliction radius of a spear is limited. The sword is more secure. So that means he was ambushed. He was somewhere and he was ambushed. 800 people. He fell on a spear. It was not because he had a choice. He fell on a spear. And with this spear, he brought down 800 men. 800 men with what? They were trained not in a regular legionnaire college. They were trained in a cave. The cave Abdullah. Israel fought against the Philistines. Those days it were the Philistines that discovered iron. So their armor, they were armed to the teeth. When you fight, when you see the Philistine army, when they charge, you see their armor, their shin guard. And so when they came to fight, Israel saw the armor of the Philistines and ran away. It was Shammah, the son of Aki, one soldier. He, standing, he stood in the midst of the field and he, he defended it. And the Bible says that his hand was weary and he cleaved to the soul. That is, involuntarily he cleaved. You need bitter leaf and hot water to, to open it. He raised them where? In a cave. It's not an Islamic word. It's the name of a cave where charlatans became champions. And there is such a school of the spirit. Where a little one can become a strong nation. I present to you students that have passed through the first stage of education in the cave. Abdullah. God bless you.